I've got this big, ginormous eraser. Look at this. Don't put your hand up there, Dad. That section's ruined. You see in this storm out there, the sky turned green. Does lightning ever hit propane bottles? It is day 22 of working on the Griffin Sword. I just spent the last couple of days grinding this fuller. We didn't video all that because it was just hours and hours of me over at the grinder, coming back to the bench, checking things with my little depth gauge over and over and over. The style of fuller that I actually ended up going with is quite a bit different than what I started with. What I started with was that two and a quarter inch wheel, the wheel that was a two inch wrapped with duct tape around it. Well, that didn't work out so good right here. It wasn't getting the fuller as deep as I wanted it and it wasn't looking as defined as I wanted it. So I ended up using smaller wheels on the fuller and I have this more aggressive edge now and a little bit of a, a kind of a flat bottom or not flat, but just a gentle curve. So if you think about it, the shape of the fuller is more like an oval shape now. For today, I'm almost done grinding on this thing. Just have a little bit more finish grinding. The finish grinding I'm doing is at 240 grit. Let's head over to the grinder and I'll show you how I've been using these smaller wheels to grind this wider fuller. Coffee break. Nice cold morning. Oh, that is so good. Started using a little bit more coffee in the pot. It tastes like liquid dark chocolate. Mmm. Do the grinder. So I've got a small wheel on here. This one's like five eighths or three quarters of an inch. And this is the wheel that I use to kind of fake in about half of the fuller. With this size wheel, I'm about as deep as I can go without the wheel making the groove wider right here. But as this tapers wider and wider, I get close to my scribe line with the wheel and then I can kind of fake in the bottom by moving it up and down. For the large portion of the fuller, I've been using this like one inch wheel here and I do the same thing. Come in here and focus on this top line, get close to that. And then I can come back and blend in the bottom. By using these wheels that are smaller than the fuller, I can get a really aggressive fuller on the edges, a really aggressive curve. And I can customize the bottom of the fuller and keep it from getting too deep. The way I've been checking the depth is with this uh, depth gauge here. You just set this down in the fuller and when you turn this, this little rod comes out the bottom and measures the depth. So about 88 and a half thousandths deep right there. So just short of 90 thousandths. That means the webbing material there in the middle should be somewhere around 70 thousandths thick still. So we're nice and good there on that. I'm also using this to check, to make sure I have things consistent from side to side as far as depth goes. The depth is not the same all the way down the fuller. In fact, it gets shallower and shallower as we go down, that's fine. But what I wanna do is make sure that I have consistent depth on both sides. It's going just past the 20. So what I do is flip it over and measure it in the same spot and we're going just past the 20 again. So we have a good consistent depth there. You can check it in multiple places going down the fuller. I'm gonna go down the blade on both sides now, checking it. I think I still have one or two little high places that maybe don't match on the other side. I'm gonna find those, give them a little Sharpie mark. We're gonna go over to the grinder, just do a touch of this fine tuning that I've been spending hours doing and uh, we'll move on from there. Five minutes later. I measured a bunch of spots with the depth gauge and I found a little area here that's a little higher than this section on the other side of the blade. You're gonna get to see how I've been doing this little up and down motion to kind of fake in the bottom of the fuller. The first grinding of the day, don't wanna mess it up right away. Hey, hey, hey. I'm on brain alert level 9,000 right now as I'm almost done grinding this clip. I don't wanna make any tiny little slips at this point. If I accidentally put a little bit too much pressure on the wheel, it might catch on the edge of the fuller and grind away that crispy edge, completely ruining the look of the fuller. In that case, to fix it, I would have to grind the entire fuller a little bit wider. 
and I don't want to do that because I'm so close to being done grinding on this fuller. That's basically what I've been doing the whole time grinding this fuller. I work the edges and then I'll go in and do what we just did and work the bottom a little bit, blend all that in. That's probably enough. I'll double check it with the depth gauge to make sure that it's a little closer to the other side now. The average dagger most people make has a blade around 10 inches long. I was just looking at the size of this thing. There's 10 inches. So that right there is the size of the average dagger that I've seen made out there. It's 12 inches to the fuller, which is a, a pretty big dagger. We've got that plus all this. <laughs> The next thing I need to focus on is cleaning up the ends of the fuller. I need to get this end looking good, but it doesn't need to be perfect because this is going to be all hidden underneath the guard. I need to get this small end though looking perfect because you're going to see that. So I need to make sure everything's nice and symmetrical there. I think I need to make myself a new scribe line too. I've kind of went over that one a little bit. I need to make a new one there. I'm going to start though with the easier end that uh, doesn't need to be perfect. To shape the ends of these, I'm gonna start out with just a little stone that's kind of rounded over a little bit. Might take me a little while to find the best position for this. <laughs> oh. With the light there, two little strokes made me realize that there's probably a lot of dust I'm breathing. Well, phooey, that means I gotta take my hat off. I like my hat, it's nice and warm. My favorite hat. My goal with this small stone on the rotary tool is to shape the ends of the fuller, get the shape really defined and uh, symmetrical, get it shaped exactly how I want. It's going to leave a really rough finish that has some little high and low spots, but I'm planning to blend all that in and smoothen it up on the 2x72 grinder and a round wheel. I'll probably use a belt with a really thick kind of soft backer to it to blend all this in and uh, make it look nice and smooth. Before using the stone, I tried cleaning up the ends of the fuller on the 2x72 grinder, but I felt like it was a little too difficult to uh, shape things, get everything looking symmetrical. Because I'm working on the end of the fuller, that meant one of my hands was holding this heavy sword in one hand, and things were just too hard to hold stable and grind the ends clean on the 2x72. The stone on the rotary tool is actually working amazingly well to clean up the ends of the fuller and get them shaped how I want them to be. It's day 24 of working on the Griffin sword. The other day I ended up spending almost the entire day working on the final grinding for the fuller. I'm very happy with how that grinding came out, but man, it took me a long time. So what did I do yesterday, you might say? Well, I spent the entire day figuring out different ways to get the fuller sanded. So one of the things I actually tried was this little tool here. This thing runs on air and it basically just strokes, really, really short strokes, really fast, and it holds a little EDM stone. And that stone can actually finish out your blade. That thing goes really, really fast. Something else I tried was using little flap wheels and stuff like this on the little hand rotary piece. Didn't work at all, took like two seconds to figure out. Here are some of those more interesting things I was talking about using to hand sand the blade. So this is a piece of small CPVC plumbing. This is for regular house plumbing uh, to run your hot water in. I ended up putting a coupler on the end of this and then cut a slit in the coupler. So what you can do is you can take your sandpaper, stick it in that slit, and now this kind of matches the, uh, the large end of the fuller there. Next, what you do, you stick a drill bit <laughs> in the end of the pipe and it fits in there nice and tight and it gives me a way I can actually chuck this up in the drill. And then you gotta keep holding this or it'll all come undone. You move your lights around and stuff with one hand because you gotta keep holding the other end. And then you look for the other thing and it's over here on the floor. <clears throat> Meanwhile, never letting go of this so it doesn't unfurl. Spray some Windex for, keep the paper clean there. And we can actually use the drill to hand sand the fuller.
and you can just go to town with this. There's one of the problems right there. I wasn't trying to illustrate one of the main problems, but it, it just showed itself. It can get caught on that edge and just pull right off, and that's super annoying, because every time that happens, uh, you gotta rewrap your sandpaper, and sometimes the sandpaper like just rips in half. None of these different things I showed you to hand sand the fuller worked. I thought that maybe one of them would cut off hours and hours of hand sanding and make it so the, the finish came out beautiful, but nothing quite worked out like that. So I got the other side of the fuller sanded yesterday. What did I end up going with in order to do that? Well, the main two things were good old elbow grease from righty and lefty here and erasers. So I've got a couple erasers here. This is your normal kind of size one and this is one of dad's uber super giant ones for big mistakes. And I put a radius on the edges. Oh, by the way, I'm not using just a straight eraser. This is just the backer. I'm wrapping the eraser with sandpaper. I'm not just sitting there <laughs> erasing grind marks with an eraser. I should have made that clear. Wrap the sandpaper around it, and that gives me a little bit of a backer, uh, and the backer has a little bit of squish too, so it'll kind of conform to the, uh, the radius being dynamic and changing as we go down the fuller. So now that I took you through all the different things I tried, let's get into sanding this fuller. Let's get this side sanded up to 600 grit so it looks as good as the other side, which you haven't seen yet. Get rid of all this junk. The grit I ground the fuller to is 240 grit. It might be beneficial to start hand sanding at 220 and then go up from there, but I thought it would save a little bit of time to skip a grit, so I'm gonna start at 320. That's what I did on the other side, and it worked pretty well. Using Windex to clean the sandpaper, help it cut better and longer. And right now, I'm just gonna focus on the first inch or two. All I wanna really do is get this plunge cleaned up, and that's one of the most difficult parts of hand sanding this entire project. There's just a whole, whole lot of this. A whole lot of this. Hand sanding this side of the fuller is gonna be a little bit more difficult because my brother Josh, who runs the uh, video camera and edits all the YouTube videos, is asking that we keep this light off for the videos so it looks better and I look better. But it also means I can't see what I'm doing. Now I can see kind of. It's just really dark. <laughs> but really for what I'm doing here, I did so much of it yesterday, I could probably do it without looking at all. Like, okay, I'm feeling that I'm kind of over here on the left side of the fuller now. Yep, do that a little bit. Let's see. I can probably section a new piece of paper there. Yep, paper's getting a little dull. Feel that. Sand on the right side of the fuller a little bit. So, probably don't even need to see what I'm doing because I did so much of it already. See, what happens if I hand sand the fuller in now versus later is that right now I'll get the fuller sanded, these corners will get rounded a little bit, and then we'll come in and grind the edge bevels. And when we grind those edge bevels, it'll grind down into the fuller a little bit, pretty much everywhere except for the very base here, and that'll re-crisp up all the fuller. <sighs> I just finished sanding both ends of the fuller, the time consuming parts. If you're wondering what all the extra noise is, dad is currently making up some uh, tightly twisted Damascus for fittings on a dagger he's about to build. Got the forge running over there and the press and twisting and vent fans and all sorts of stuff. I, however, am gonna go ahead and show you how I'm sanding the field of the, uh, the fuller here. So the big portion in the middle, I've got this big ginormous eraser with Two different radius, radius, radii, radius is, is, is radii. We've got a gentle radius here and a really aggressive one. I can use that gentle radius up here on the uh, big area and the more aggressive one down here when the fuller gets smaller. For this, I'm using the biggest strip of sandpaper I've ever hand sanded with. 
I need something that's as wide as this eraser is. So we'll just take this and wrap it, wrap it around the, uh, the eraser. And then I hold it into place, Windex, and start sanding. Don't put your hand up there, Dad. Oh. Dad's like, oh my God, I catch it. I saw you put your hand up on top of the billet. Wait. Mm. Mm. Going in the opposite direction. That that section's ruined. Which I've done I've done going? that before. I've I've done that before manually. I've ruined billets going the wrong way. Yep. I pushed it that way. Gotta go the other way, Josh. At first I thought it was splitting because it was too tight, but it's it's the opposite direction. You see in this storm out there, the sky turned green. And there's some hail. And there was huge gusts of wind a minute ago. It's kind of calmed down a little bit, but it is so green outside. Look at this little tiny hail on the ground. Look at that. Does lightning ever hit propane bottles? I need to YouTube that later. <laughs> Can you imagine lightning hitting a propane bottle? I think that will be all the sanding. I'm calling it there. I am done sanding this fuller. By the way, it's the next day now. So this is day 25 of working on the Griffin Sword. I ended up spending pretty much all of yesterday and most of today just sanding on this fuller. My hand, my thumb, is tingling, literally tingling from all the uh, sanding stick pushing I've done. It looks so good though. It looks so, so good. But look at that, it looks so good. I am so exhausted. My arms are just super sore. That was like days, three, three and a half days of hand sanding on this fuller. Wow. It came out really nice though. It's kind of funny seeing this like finished fuller in the midst of a very unfinished blade. We've got uh, blade bevels to grind and stuff on here, but the fuller should be pretty much done until etching. Before I end the day, I'm gonna go ahead and give this a protective coating right now. I don't want this to rust. The 1000 grit finish is pretty much the final finish that this blade will need to have before I etch it after all the handle's done. Let's get some good dicum sprayed on here. Wow, <laughs> really blued my finger. <laughs> Would you look at that? That's, that's actually really pretty. It looks like a deep blue anodized aluminum or titanium. That fuller being sanded to 1000 grit, the dicum actually looks really pretty on it. Such a smooth, silky blue color. I kind of want to lick it. It looks like it would taste good. <laughs> And that is it for today. The fuller is finally done. What a huge undertaking. That took way longer to grind and way longer to hand sand than I was thinking, but I love the results. We've got this beautiful wide fuller here that tapers down nice and small. And once we grind these edge bevels in, it's gonna taper even more and look even more dynamic than it currently is.
Getting lighter. <laughs> Still kind of heavy, but getting lighter. It is day 26 of working on the Griffin Sword. I am finally, finally, finally done grinding in the fuller and sanding the fuller. That took forever. Today, we're gonna be grinding in the edge bevels. This blade is currently a solid quarter inch thick, not very sharp at all, very blunt, very heavy still, <laughs> hard to swing around. This is gonna lose so much weight today, but we're gonna hog, I mean hog material off. We're gonna use a coarsest belt I have, and we're gonna use the corner of it and just be grinding that material away so fast. There's gonna be sparks and more sparks and sparks catching on fire and fiery sparks all over the place. As always, before we get to grinding, I need some layout lines to follow. There are no layout lines on this edge. I need to get good solid layout lines right now because this will be the last time I'll be able to add layout lines to the edge. As I start grinding in these blade bevels, it's gonna taper the blade and we won't be able to lay it on the flat granite anymore. So I need to get good lines to follow right now, which also means I need to make a decision how thick do I wanna leave this edge after grinding? The edge is gonna be flat ground with the very edge being convexed. So the convex will go down to like 10 thousandths of an inch or so. That's not what I need to decide right now though, the convex part, I need to decide how thick I wanna leave the edge before it's been convexed. The number I'm throwing around in my head is 40 thousandths. I think I'm gonna try some different layout lines and just see how they look. Also, we've got a beautiful Griffin sticker here. It is very cold today and I have ginormous fingers, and I cannot separate the back of this sticker from the front. Let's use a little help of our Matt Diskin designed automatic. There we go. I love this little knife, by the way. Matt Diskin design, made by Kershaw. <laughs> now we're ready. Coffee break. Oh, that's cold. Now we're ready. <laughs> 11 minutes later. An update. After staring at this, I think what I wanna go with is 45 thousandths on the edge. I'm gonna dry off this dicum I just sprayed over these lines I made. We're gonna do the actual scribe lines on this thing. Also, if you're wondering why it looks so cold in the shop and I'm wearing all this, we've got the garage door open. Dad's over there hammering away, forging out a mosaic Damascus dagger right now. Woo, good tea. You can see all the high and low spots on my sword now. <laughs> One other thing I wanted to do before we rough grind this is to actually weigh it before and after grinding. So I've got a scale here, get it centered on there. Four pounds and 12 ounces. This thing is very heavy. Let me know down in the comments what your guess is for how heavy this blade will be after I'm done grinding on it. And by that, I mean like after the edge bevels are ground in, not after all the tang is shaped and all that stuff. Just for a reference, I'm estimating the finished weight of this sword with the handle and everything included to be somewhere around the uh, like 3.2 to four pound mark, kind of in that range. So this blade has a lot of weight to lose because it's currently heavier than I want the entire sword to be. I think after I grind in these edge bevels, the sword is gonna weigh two pounds and 10 ounces. That's my guess. Josh, you just saw how heavy the sword is. What's your guess for the, uh, the post grinding weight? I think it's gonna be two pounds and 10 ounces. That's my guess. <laughs> I don't oh, know. also the background's bad. Hey dad, you got like a minute? So this sword blade currently weighs four pounds and 12 ounces. What's your guess for how heavy it's gonna be once I get the edge bevels ground in? Three pounds, six ounces. Three pounds, six ounces. Very good. Back to forging. All right, mom, so this sword currently weighs four pounds and 12 ounces. We're having everybody guess the weight on it. How heavy do you think it's gonna be once I get these edge bevels ground in? Two pounds, 15 ounces. Two pounds, 15. All right, perfect. Actually, I think that's, that's a good guess. <laughs> that's guess. probably. That's probably better than my guess. We are ready to go do some serious rough grinding with a coarse 36 grit belt at the grinder. The bevel grinding on this sword will give it the ultimate transformation. Right now it just kind of looks like a sword shaped object with a fuller, 
But once we get these bevels ground in, it's really gonna start looking like a real sword. I'm using a coarse 36 grit incinerator belt from Broadbeck. This thing has some nasty, gnarly ceramic on it and just eats away at the hardened steel very quickly. I need to be sure not to overheat any of the edge as I grind on it. If I heat up any of the edge too much with the grinder, I could ruin the blade. The reason heat from grinding could ruin the blade is because it could temper the blade automatically from the heat and temper it at a temperature that's higher than we actually tempered the blade, making it too soft in that area. You would either have to re-harden the blade, which is gonna be more difficult now that the edge bevels are starting to get ground in, or start over completely if you can't re-harden the blade. Yeah, after that little accident, I think I'm gonna have to be a little bit more careful when I'm taking the blade out of my uh, my cool water tank there. <laughs> there is a fluorescent light hanging above and this blade is way bigger than a normal dagger. So I gotta make sure I don't bang into that thing. I got really lucky I didn't hit a bulb and shatter it right over my head. To quickly eat away at the material on the blade, I used the corner of the belt. Using the corner of the belt allows me to apply more pressure in a small area, forcing the ceramic grit on the belt to eat away at the steel very quickly. The closer I get to establishing nice blade bevels, the more I flatten out how I'm grinding up against the belt. So to simplify it, I start off grinding really aggressively using the corner of the belt, and then as the bevels get bigger and bigger, I start laying the blade against the belt flatter and flatter and not removing material so aggressively. I definitely don't want to grind away too much material in any one given place or I'll end up with a thin spot on the edge or I'll have to make the entire sword thinner because of it. I've got a nice bright work light set up right at the grinder so I can more easily see the scribe lines on the edge of the blade. I don't want to grind over those scribe lines and if you can't see them then you don't know when you've ground to them. So having a work light set up for me is crucial. It's the end of the day and I am done working on the sword for now. I just removed so much weight. The sword has gotten a lot, lot lighter just after that grinding session. I still have a lot more material to grind off though, so I'm not gonna weigh it just yet, but I can already feel it. It's definitely getting easier to swing. Overall, it's looking really good. It's actually starting to look like a sword now. We've got blade bevels coming in. We've got beautiful fuller. I am loving this thing so far. <laughs> The Lord Cross. It's day 30 of working on the Griffin Sword. We've skipped a couple days because I have been grinding this thing day after day after day, rough grinding it. I currently have the bevels rough ground. They're probably a little beyond rough at this point though. I did 36 grit to rough them in, and then I did a lot of the grinding at 50 grit, and then I finished the rough grinding stage 
at 180 grit. Let's go over to the disc sander, change out some fresh paper, get my respirator on and start disc sanding this, uh, this side of the blade here that I haven't touched yet. I'm at the disc sander. You might notice this is not in its normal place. It normally goes way back over here in this corner. But the sword is so long that there's a wall over here and there's a grinder over here completely in my way. So yesterday, Dad, Dad and I drug this thing out to the middle of the floor. We had to unscrew it from the wall, undo the ductwork, and now we've got this kind of janky looking vacuum hose pipe going from the ventilation system all the way over to here so we still have some, uh, some ventilation sucking all this dust out. I didn't change the paper on this disc sander yet. This one's kind of worn out. I wanted to show you the uh, changing process because it's exciting. The sandpaper on the disc sander does not get a lot of mileage at all. It wears out very quickly and it still feels a little bit sharp. Like if I was hand sanding, that would still be sharp to me. But on the disc sander, it needs to be like brand new sharp to do, to do well. So there's the old piece. I'm just using the regular 320 grit 3M uh, wet dry sandpaper that I use for hand sanding. To hold the sandpaper onto the disc, we're gonna use some spray adhesive. Dad made this little cover here so we don't spray spray adhesive all over the disc sander and have dust sticking to it horribly. Shake it up, spin, spray just a little bit. And then I wanna spray some on the sandpaper too. Just a little bit, <coughs> really nasty stuff. We're gonna have the vent on here in a second. Okay. And then the key thing to this, this won't work unless you have one of these. You have to have a Kyle Royer made chopper that's made for doing competition cutting. If you don't have one of these, you won't be able to trim the uh, paper off the disc properly. And you'll have to just buy pre-made round pieces of paper or something else like that. There's no way you'll possibly be able to do anything like this without a specifically Kyle Royer made competition chopper. So I can just take this, come over to the edge of the disc and trim the paper. All the way around, nice and pretty. We can hand sand with that later. This is probably way too much detail on how I'm changing the paper. This isn't a course, this is a YouTube video. What am I thinking? Okay, that is ready to go. I'm gonna be running it at a nice low speed here. Something like that. I don't know how fast that is. It's 30. I'm turning it at 30 speed. All right, let's go get my respirator on because even with this vent, I've noticed uh, this thing creates an incredible amount of really fine dust. So this suction system is super good, but I still probably wanna have the respirator on because that dust is getting up in my face and glasses and the sword blade. <laughs> I noticed right away that I should probably start disc sanding with a little bit coarser sandpaper on the disc sander. But the only thing I have that's coarser that fits on here is like 80 grit and that's too coarse. So we're gonna go ahead and suffer through the 220. At least I won't need to jump up a grit. It'll already be at the, the final grit I wanted to disc sand at. But it probably would have been real handy to have some like 200 or maybe 180 grit on hand for this and then jumped up the next grit. One of the beautiful key benefits of using the disc sander is you have this super wide flat surface that you're sanding on the blade with. And that allows you to get rid of those high and low spots in the blade very easily. A couple of the negatives to using the disc sander are that the paper wears out very, very quickly on the disc sander. And I find it needs to be extremely sharp in order for it to cut. So after only a couple of minutes, I have to switch out the paper to a fresh piece. Okay, so disc sanding this blade took me a while because it is now day 31 of working on the Griffin sword. Wow, I went through so many sheets of sandpaper. I got the blade looking really, really good though. Take a look at all this 220 grit. Look at all this. I disc sanded this blade so much, but the results I think are really gonna be worth it because one of the main problems I had were, were some low spots right here. That transition from where this bevel went to uh, being narrow on the fuller to extra wide kind of made my belt do some weird, funny things right here. And I had these low spots in all four places that happened. 
The disc sander got rid of those low spots because it's hitting a much broader area and it got everything looking really nice and smooth, nice and flat. Also, check out something really cool that I've been playing around with. Look at what we can do with the sword blade now. Wow, it flexes so much. Look at this. Woo, woo, woo. You can do it the other way. Yeah. This is exactly what I wanted the sword to do. It's nice and flexy, but yet it's still stiff. It took me quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of pressure to do that. The reason it flexes like that and doesn't stay bent is because we hardened and tempered this blade. This blade is virtually a really long spring. It's a little bit harder than something like a car spring would be because we want it to hold a good edge, but it's kind of in that same realm as a spring. So you can actually flex it and it'll go right back to where it was. Look, look at how much you can flex it. That is insane. <laughs> I am very happy with how this flexes. The next thing we have to do on this sword is to actually convex the edge. What is convexing? Well, convexing is where the edge is kind of thick, um, flat, and you put a radius on the uh, slack belt. And um, I just cannot think with this mess right here in front of me. Jeez. Okay, out of sight, out of mind. Now maybe, now maybe I can explain what convexing is. Convexing is where we take the slack belt, so no platen, no backer behind it, just the belt on the grinder with nothing behind it, so it'll be kind of spongy and squishy. And we're gonna lay the blade bevel on the, uh, the belt. And since that belt has a little sponge and squish to it, it will convex the edge. That will give a really strong edge that is also really refined and sharp. You can really tailor the convex to the purpose of the knife, depending on what you're wanting to do. My hands represent the two edge bevels if you're looking at the blade this way. If you left the blade flat ground, you would end up with bevels that meet like this. And then right up here, this is the, uh, the blade edge thickness. You could leave that thicker or thinner. What we're gonna do is we're gonna convex that edge so it's gonna kind of make it more of a shape like this, where the edge is kind of radiused and then the rest of it is flat. And you can tailor the convex depending on the purpose of the uh, the knife or the sword or whatever you're doing. If you're doing something like a, an ax, you can make this big old aggressive convex that's uh, extra robust and durable, so there's more material here to support the uh, extreme stuff that ax has to go through. If you're making something like a chef's knife, you can put just the tiny, tiny little hint of a convex on there because you want it super fine and, and slice, you know, really good for slicing and cutting thin things. We're gonna convex this. I do need to protect the fuller though. We've done a tremendous amount of work trying to keep these lines on the fuller really crispy in this center line right here. So to protect those, I'm just gonna use some masking tape. I find when I'm using 120 grit or 320 grit belt on the grinder doing this convex, a couple layers of tape is enough to protect the crisp lines or the spine of your blade. In this case, the spine of this blade is kind of the center line. It's not like a regular buoy or something. If the belt starts to wear through the tape, you can just stop what you're doing, put a fresh piece of tape on there and you're good to go. Ugh. Swallow, <sighs> got me rank. Ooh, I hope that wasn't too much uh, long exposition on what I'm about to do about convexing. It's a really interesting topic to me though, and there's a lot to say in my mind. Oh, that is good. Oh, yeah. We're gonna have to focus on one edge at a time here, because the tape is gonna cover up way too much of the, uh, the other side. I'm just trying to lay that tape over that crisp center line just a little bit, because that's what we're trying to protect right here. And then on the fuller, I only need about an eighth of an inch of protection there. Just enough to keep from rounding over that nice crisp line. This roll should not be used on anything that's near finished because I'm pretty sure it's impregnated with a lot of nasty stuff on the edges. Keeping your wheel, buffing wheel in a bag. Started doing that after Australia and saw corn doing it. I'm like, you know what? That actually makes a lot of sense. Cross contamination of grits and compounds. I'm rambling probably because I, I know what has to be done, but I don't have. I don't yet have the will to do it. That sound like Thanos right there. <laughs> what is that? What do you quote? Uh, Frodo? Going into the Chilub's lair? Something like that? I feel like it's a Lord of the Rings thing for some reason. But I really changed it. I know what I have to do, but I don't know if I have the strength to do it. I got the green tape on. To the grinder! Oh. 
Oh, not that way. That would have been really bad. Catch on it. Oh. Oh. Dusty. I normally would start off convexing with a 120 grit belt and then finish it out with a 320 grit belt. This time though, I decided to just start out in the middle with a 220 grit belt and keep it at that finish and go straight from there to hand sanding. That way I don't have to start with that coarser belt and then go up to the finer one. I think 220 grit will be fine enough for the hand sanding, but yet coarse enough to uh, remove the material that we need to on the edges of the blade. The edges are already pretty thin, so there's not a ton of material to remove here. It's not like on a big buoy or chopper or something where I have to convex up the blade pretty far. On this sword, it's only going to go up the blade like an eighth of an inch to maybe three sixteenths in some area. I need to very carefully keep an eye on my green masking tape though and make sure that I don't sand through both those layers. If I do, I'm going to round over those corners around the fuller and defeat the purpose of keeping all those fuller lines crisp. By the end of convexing, I noticed that I had worn through one layer of the green tape, but the second layer was pretty much unharmed, so I didn't round over any of those crisp fuller lines. I just finished convexing this thing all the way around. Holy smokes, that was a lot of convexing to do. It looks really good. I didn't get it too thin anywhere. It's maybe overall a little bit thinner than I was shooting for, but uh, at least I didn't grind it down to zero and have to sand the edge back down. I might go over the edge just a little bit and sand it down just to get it a tiny bit thicker. So we'll lose a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of width, but overall I'm very happy that it went that well. We can finally see how much this blade weighs now that I'm done grinding on it. Keep in mind, we're gonna lose some weight on the tang, but as far as the blade goes, it just needs hand sanded at this point. We've got the scale, turn it on. Get it centered right there. And it is three pounds on the dot. So it looks like as far as the weight goes on the sword, mom came the closest. Two pounds, 15 ounces. This blade is looking so good. I can't wait to move on to the fittings and the handle and really make this thing take shape. I will see you in the next video. May the forge be with you. Bye-bye.